Hello everybody. Here we are. It's already sex session six. We are going to look at translation and web content. Um, so let's uh, go ahead and get into it. Um, the usual uh, slide this week and next week. So this week um, you just took your midterm exam. Uh, hopefully that went well for you. And then this is the follow on lecture on translation. Uh, translation, why do we care? We'll look at XLIF. Uh, we'll look at TMX and we'll look at TBX. Um, we will uh, hopefully you will have read the TMX and TM um, uh, article here, and the TBX article and the XLIF 2.0 article. Uh, next week the midterm projects are due. Uh, that would be the D1 and D2. Uh, please make sure you have those turned in, and then um, the. Uh, reading is uh, all based on uh, next week's lesson, which will be on analytics, SEO, cache, CDN, and testing. So pre please uh, read the uh, websites that are listed in the syllabus. So let's talk about translation, global. Uh, global is of or relating to or involving the entire world. Um, the world, as Shakespeare said, uh, all the world's a stage, and the men and women merely players. And then, of course, that was um, also uh, then adapted uh, by the progressive rock band Rush, who said, all the world's indeed a stage, and we are merely players, performers, and portrayers, each other's audience outside the gilded cage. I almost felt like I was singing that as I was saying it. It's hard not to. Uh, so there are some realities. Uh, let's talk about the realities of translation. Uh, there's the global reality. It's nearly impossible to do business in this day and age in just one language. Uh, the evolution of communications. So the first human beings uh, used fire, smoke, drums, petroglyphs, pictograms, ideograms, and writing. Um, then came mail, uh, pigeon posts, maritime flags. In the 1300s, we advanced to wooden block movable type printing developed in China. 1400s, Gutenberg created a printing press with movable metal type. In the 1600s, the first experimental acoustic mechanical telephone came into being. By the 1700s, uh, smart uh, semaphore lines, uh, optical telegraphs. By the 1800s, electric telegraph, transatlantic telegraph, telephone, and radio. Uh, by the early 1900s, we had television and transatlantic telephone cable. By the mid um, to mid-late 1900s, we had commercial telecommunica telecommunications, satellite fiber optics, telecommunications, copper networking, cellular phone networking, SMTP, and email. And then at the very end of the 1900s, uh, we had the internet, mobile satellite, and handheld phones. Uh, the 2000s um, brought voice over internet protocol, uh, internet telephony. Is that how you pronounce that? I think so. Telephony, uh, smartphones, social media, big data, Google Glass, the Internet of Things, and so on and so on. The evolution of tools kind of followed suit. Uh, communication tools, that is. Cave paint, hammers and chisels, pe paper and ink, printing presses, typewriters, computers and printers, word processors and databases, desktop publishing, and content management systems. So where are we now in that tool continuum? Desktop publishing and tool-centric communications, while still ubiquitous, is giving way to content management systems, open standard-driven communication. Uh, so what about the communication reality? <coughs> Sorry, I just watched a hockey game and I'm uh, kind of speaking in my Canadian accent. I'm from Detroit and uh, uh, a lot of us did speak that way, so I'll try to uh, return to my uh, newly acquired West Coast uh, uh, accent. Uh, communication reality. Communication, websites, email campaigns, manuals, brochures, data sheets, marketing, uh, safety bulletins must be robust in this day and age. The machinery that creates these communications is elegant but complex, powerful but complicated. And then there's the translation reality. Today's elegant but complex, powerful but complicated tools are seldom optimized for translation. So we see some funny things. Uh, translation is tricky, it's error prone, and it's full of challenges. Uh, translating can be, an expen can be expensive, inaccurate, inconsistent, and take a long time. And then at the end of the day, you might still be invited to eat some deep fried baby, um, or to see a sign that says, 
could not connect to translation service. We've seen horror stories like this with translation before. <clears throat> the global reality restated, it is nearly impossible to do business in this day and age in just one language. Uh, so this session we'll be talking about filling the gaps, the communication reality, uh, the translation reality, and the global reality. Uh, the bottom line is that she or he who can fill this gap will enable accurate, complete, or will enable accurate, complete, timely information globally without breaking the bank. So how do we fill this gap? Well, we leverage localization, translation, open standards. We learn each open standard, we apply that open standard with the translation workflow, and we learn how tools implement that open standard. So here's one of the things that I like to talk about because there's this, these two phrases are often confused by people, open standard versus open source. People often confuse open standards with open source. Open standard is a specific instruction for achieving something that is independent of manufacturers or vendors and is available in the public domain generally without charge. Open standards often provide a standardized way to code a solution for a task. Open source, on the other hand, is the application often of that open standard. Uh, it's usually software whose source code is made available for use or modification as users or other developers see fit. It is usually developed as public collaboration and made freely available. So let's test that out with the things that we're talking about. Open standards are not software, not tools, not proprietary, and not de facto. De facto. They are solutions or specifications for creating softwares or to software or tools that solve a common need. Some well-known open standards are HTML, XML, DITA, XLIF, USB, etc. The open standard is open standards to learn in this session. We have already talked about XML for uh, all localization and translation open standards and all localization Okay, and the, opens, <laughs> the localization open standards that we will talk about in this class are XLIF, TMX, and TBX. So this is a slide, <coughs> this is a picture that somebody took of me when I was explaining localization at a conference in <coughs> Wiesbaden, Germany. I was speaking English, but it sounded like I was speaking some foreign language because I hadn't taken the time to outline or define uh, some standard uh, translation terms. Uh, LSP, Localization Service Provider, is a company providing translation and localization services. SRX, Segmentation Rules Exchange, an XML open standard defining how to segment text for translation. TBX, Term-Based Exchange, an XML open standard for representing and exchanging terminological data. TM, Translation Memory, is a collection of segments that can be sentences, paragraphs, or text strings that have previously been translated in order to aid human translators. TMX is Translation Memory Exchange. That's the open standard that deals with uh, TM. XLIF, XML Localization Interchange File Format, is the open standard for defining a lossless interchange uh, for translating text. And then finally, XML Extensible Markup Language. <coughs> so now let's talk about GILT. Um, GILT is an acronym for globalization internationalization, localization, translation. Uh, globalization means marketing uh, a product or a company worldwide. Internationalization means creating a product that can be marketed worldwide. Localization means adapting the product to the linguistic and cultural norms of the region. And translation is reproducing the text from a source language into a target language. So let's think about these in terms of challenges. Remember I said at this class that this is the hot thing. This is the thing that people are trying to solve. Translation is really difficult, and translation uh, is a big challenge. But it, the challenge comes in many different uh, flavors. Let's first talk about the file transfer challenge. Do we send the native source files directly to the translation uh, service provider? The answer, no, we shouldn't do that, only if you want it to cost top dollar and take a long time and have errors. Converting it to XLIF is the solution for this challenge. So let's look at XLIF. XLIF is the XML Localization Interchange File Format. It's an OASIS open standard for the exchange of localization and translation content. 
The latest version 2.0 is at that URL shown on the screen. Uh, translation tools use XLIF as their native file format. That means just as uh, Microsoft Word uses .doc as their native file format, XLIF uses .xlf or XLIF files, excuse me, translation tools use XLIF uh, as their native file format. Translators know and like XLIF. XLIF 1.2 was passed February 2008 with a specification and a schema. XLIF 2.0 uh, passed August 2014 with a specification and a schema. XLIF 2.1 we are now in the process of passing and I hope that that will be available um, by the end of June 2017. Uh, truth in advertising, I am the chair of the XLIF technical committee so XLIF is near and dear to me. Uh, why do we care? Uh, translation tools open XLIF as their native file format so there's no conversion overhead, no overhead for translators to buy and learn proprietary software. Some formats are exceedingly difficult to translate in their native format like websites, software, and graphics. But if we convert it to XLIF then the uh, translator doesn't care how difficult the format is. Uh, the need to provide information to people who speak a different language is an age-old challenge. The evolution of the translation process over the years looked something like this. In the beginning, translations were done by brute force. Over time, successful methods became repeatable processes that could be documented and shared from one group to another. As momentum grew, these processes became ad hoc standards. The game changer, the watershed moment, occurred when we recognized that the ad hoc standards needed to evolve into open standards. So the impact of XLIF, once XLIF and its fellow translation standards became open standards, tools, translators, content management systems, and translation customers could exchange translation workflows in a predictable way. As other XML-based open standards arrived, such as DITA, SVG, DocBook, and HTML, it became possible to automate the translation workflow using standard tools. So let's think about how XLIF works as a process. Uh, we call this the XLIF round trip. The XLIF round trip refers to the following translation workflow. A source file is in a single language. Example, let's say a Microsoft Word in English. Step two, we transform the source file into the XLIF format. Step three, we translate the XLIF file into the target language. Step four, the tra we transform the XLIF back into the source file format. For example, if we translated the XLIF into Chinese, then in our example, the Microsoft Word file would be transformed, the XLIF would be transformed into a Microsoft Word file in Chinese. So graphically, that looks something like this. We're, we're talking about the extract and merge paradigm. So we start off with a source, document, website, or software. We extract the localizable text and format information into a single XLIF file. The translation service provider opens the XLIF file with their translation tool and they translate the text. They save the translated XLIF file, so now we have a bilingual XLIF file which we convert back into its original format and we have a translated document website or software. The XLIF translation model is very, very dirt simple. That's what makes it so good. We isolate the translatable text into translation units with the uh, source language here and then we translate into the target language here in the target elements. We retain the source document structure either externally or internally via the XLIF file through the uh, XLIF skeleton. Uh, we do that internally uh, with groups or externally with the XLIF file uh, via the skeleton file. So here's how it kind of works. Imagine you have this uh, file in a desktop publishing software in InDesign. So we have a uh, heading and some paragraphs and a bulleted list. Um, we could export the XML into the native file format. So this is not uh, um, uh, XLIF yes, this XLIF yet. This is just um, the uh, XML that comes out of the application. It has all of the XML that makes that uh, InDesign document. We transform it into XLIF. So now we have trans we have um, units that have source and target for each of the pairs that we want to translate. The idea is that we 
translate the source into the target language. Uh, so the translator translates the file using the uh, computer-aided translation software, which I will demonstrate in just a minute here, and I will ask you to try to use as well. Uh, so they translate the software into German in this case, some beautifully perfect German, and we save the XLIF file, and we transform it back into the same XML format, but this time, instead of having English, we have German. We transform that, uh, or we open that into InDesign, and now we have the same file, but it is German rather than English. So now we're going to do an exercise. I, uh, we will, I will demonstrate this. Basically, what we're going to do is we're going to open an XLIF file for translation. So you will need to install the XMarker software that I provided at D2L. So the idea is you go to D2L, and you hopefully have already done this. In the w4, WT4CP directory that you created way back in the XML uh, um, uh, class, or the, I think that was class two, uh, I had asked you to make all of these folders, and I asked you to create a downloads folder and to download everything that was in the um, resources directory. One of those things you will find was either the XMarker setup exe, which is for uh, Windows, or the XMarker setup um, uh, DMG, which is for Mac, Apple. So depending on which one uh, is yours, since I'm demonstrating this on Windows machine, I downloaded this uh, into this directory, and I'm just going to double click here and I have this xmarker setup.exe so please go ahead and double click that and install the xmarker software so my system is thinking about it so you might get uh, as uh, something like this that says uh, you, the smart screen can't be reached um, and then uh, you would uh, in some cases it would ask you to there would be a more button in my case I've already clicked the more button so I'm going to say run anywhere anyway Okay, and it's going to ask me if I'm sure about that. I'll say yes. And it brings up the installer. By the way, this is software that I wrote, so um, I, it's fully supported by me. <laughs> uh, so you will uh, hit your next button. Sorry, this is going off into my other screen, so I have to drag it into this screen. Um, I'm going to let anyone who uses this computer use it. And I'm going to uh, accept the default um, uh, destinations. Hit next and I'm going to say OK, put it in that directory, hit Next, and um, it's going to say that this is where it's going to put it. I'll say Fine, and you will see it will give you an, a, a screen that it's installing. It went so fast that I couldn't show it to you, so I'll say, now I'll say Finish. Okay, so now I will um, let's see here. I thought I said Finish. I hope this is installed. Okay, recently added, so I'll go into my XMarker software. By the way, these are avocados that I, it's a picture I took at my mother's house of all places. And it'll bring up this uh, XMarker splash screen, which is on my other screen, which you can't see right now. And then it brings up the graphical user interface. So the next thing that you need to do is go back into your uh, downloads directory in WT4CP, grab your XMarker file, zip, I'm going to copy that. And I'm going to go back into the uh, this directory. And I'm going to go into translate subdirectory. I'm going to go ahead and paste that. And then I'm going to extract it. And I'm going to say go ahead and extract it here at this location. And it's extracting right now. Uh, I'm not going through the steps of how to extract it because that you remember from a previous uh, from a previous class. Okay, so it made me this directory. I'm going to copy this directory. Control C. I'm going to go to my Documents folder. You don't have to do this, but it's just easier because that's where um, XMarker looks for these files. And so I'll orient you to these files. You'll see that you have uh, in uh, terms, TM, and some other things. The directories that we're really going to care about are in, TM for translation memory, and terms. Okay, so let's uh, minimize that. 
So we have our X marker software working. By the way, if this doesn't work for you, don't worry too much about it, just follow along. But if it does work for you, um, and the reason I say that it may or may not is because sometimes different computers have different versions of Java. So as I said, this is uh, uh, software that I wrote. So the first thing I'm gonna do is open the XLIF file, and please do this yourself. Navigate to the XMarker files directory, go to my in directory, and I'm going to take this thing called TC, which is, stands for Translation Candidates, and I'm going to open it. So this is the XLIF file. It's a file about um, uh, bands that I like. And I'm also, go I know that I need to uh, deal with translation uh, memory and glossary. So I'm gonna go ahead and uh, hit the uh, set TM file. And I'm going to, that's for translation memory. I'm gonna navigate upward and I'm going to go into TM and I'm gonna say all formats and I'm gonna grab my TM and I'm going to open it. And then this window shows up to display what uh, uh, the translation memory is, and it's uh, going to be translation memory that matches some of the terms in my XLIF file. So I'm gonna say set as TM, and it's going to uh, say okay, I'll do that. And then I also know that I'm going to worry about my TBX file. So I'm gonna say uh, set the terms file, and I'm going to navigate upward, and I'm going to set, select my terms, and there's a TBX file. I'm gonna open it, and it created this TBX file, which has some terms and glossaries that are going to be meaningful for this um, XLIF file. So I'm gonna set that as my glossary. So now I have an XLIF file, and I've got a translation memory file, a TMX file, and I've got a terms file, a TBX file. So uh, that's as far as we needed to get for now. So I'm gonna set this aside. And uh, why don't you guys go ahead and do that and then restart the, uh, the video when you've uh, finished that. Okay, so here we are, we're back. Go back into presentation mode. And we've finished this exercise. So that's XLIF, that's the XML localization interchange file format. So we have the, the format that the computer-aided translation tools can open. But what about the second challenge, translation memory? Um, so this is our, our, our uh, person who's learning about translation uh, making the following statement. Uh, this thing I'm sending contains several segments that I've already translated in the past. Isn't there a way to leverage the already translated segments? Answer, yes, you can, as long as your localization, you or your localization service provider have been saving your translation pairs in the form of TMX files. But wait, can't I just store them in a spreadsheet? You can answer yes, you can, but using the open standard lets you transfer, transfer the translation memory from vendor to vendor and is directly accessible to the computer-aided translation tool. So let's talk about TMX, uh, translation memory and TMX. Um, TMX, translation memory exchange, is an open standard for the exchange of translation uh, memory. It's available at that URL there. Uh, translation tools use TMX to, to leverage and add to translation memory. The TMX 1.4b specification passed April 2005. There's a specification and an XML DTD. So there's a distinction between TMX and TM. And hint, hint, this might just show up on a, on a, on a test. Translation memory enables the translation of segments, sentences, paragraphs, or phrases of documents by searching for similar segments in a collection and suggesting matches that are found. To quote the reading that you did to prepare for this class, a TM system remembers translations that have been typed by a human translator. When the translator needs to work on a similar text, the system offers the previously saved version. This can save a lot of time when a translator works with repetitive texts, such as technical manuals, and also can help to achieve terminological consistency uh, found in the database. Uh, some kind of a strange typo there. Um, so how does that work? Let's say we're starting off with a data file and we have some content here. Nirvana was an American grunge band from Aberdeen, the state of Washington. The Clash founded in 1976 is considered one of the most influential early uh, punk rock bands alongside such other bands such as the Ramones and the Sex Pistols. Soundgarden is an American grunge band from Seattle. These happen to be all bands that I like. So that's a DITA topic. 
um, we open the XLIF file, uh, we see that uh, we have our language pairs there, or our, our, our uh, XLIF file that has the source. Uh, we're going to set the TM as I just dis demonstrated. Uh, we see that this TMX file has some of those same strings, but it has uh, translations from past translation jobs that have been uh, saved, approved, and then added to the TMX file. Um, we can see that there are some, there's the English and there's the German in this case, English, German, English, German. Um, so we said we wanted to, uh, oh, so in order to leverage that TM file, uh, we're going to uh, use the Translation Candidates XLIF 2.0 module. We'll click that button. Uh, it will then uh, interject the um, uh, source and target into uh, the XLIF file in the um, uh, MTC match uh, namespace. So these are not yet translations. The XLIF source is here, but the uh, translation memory source is here. Then it's up to a human being to decide if this uh, uh, translation from translation memory is suitable for this uh, English source. Uh, you'll, if so, you'll uh, accept the translation. Um, and then we end up with the actual uh, translation memory injected into the uh, into the unit. Okay, so then we convert the uh, uh, XLIF back into DITA and we see that we now have uh, a German uh, DITA topic. Okay, so let's do that. Let's try that. So we've already, let's go ahead and pull up our um, uh, X marker software. We've already set the TM as the uh, um, translation memory file. So let's go ahead and uh, translate. Uh, so what we see then is the uh, first, um, hmm, didn't, oh, I know, let's put that away. Um, I skipped a step. We have to hit this translation candidates, uh, translation candidates button. And it says, this is the TM file that you set. Is this the one you want to use? Uh, zoom in, I'll say, yeah, that looks good. And I'll move that to source. Okay, so now what it did is it took this translation memory file and it found everything that looks like it was a, um, <coughs> a good candidate for uh, in the uh, uh, TMX file and it put it alongside the translation. It hasn't let us do the translation yet, but it did give us the, um, the uh, uh, it, it seeded the XLIF file with the TMX file. Okay, so now let's do the translation. So we translate and see here, I've already translated this one, so I'll go to the next one. Hmm. This demonstration didn't work. Uh, so uh, as I said, unless I make an egregious mistake, uh, I'm just going to keep going. So uh, let's go back. Let's think here, what did I do wrong? Hard to say. Um, well, let's just, uh, I'll, I'll just wing it then. So let's go back to the, uh, the, the first um, segment here. And uh, what we would, would have seen is that the translation memory match, I think I did this out of sequence. So we'll just translate this by hand. So uh, we'll um, just put a uh, XXXX here. That, tran that is how we're going to translate this string. Uh, next, we'll uh, put an XXXX here, and that's the translation for that string, and so forth. So we're doing a pseudo-translation here, and we're going to say we're done. Okay, and then what we see then is that our pseudo-translations actually made it into the XLIF file. So that wasn't exactly a demonstration of TMX, uh, because it didn't exactly work as expected, but uh, that's the way it goes sometimes. Okay, so then let's talk about TBX, uh, translation, translation Glossary. In my industry or company, there are a lot of terms that could be ambiguous for the translators who are not necessarily experts in our field. Also, we want to make sure that certain terms are always translated correctly, uh, consistent with my company's style guide. Can I send a glossary of terms to the translators to keep all of this straight? Answer yes. Store your translation, excuse me, your glossary in TBX files. 
the tools can read these directly and TVX defines standardized ways to store, use uh, metadata about the terms. And again, since it's an open standard, you can pass it from vendor to vendor and they will understand it. So what's this TBX all about? TBX is term-based uh, um, exchange. It's the open standard for representing termolo terminological data. It's available at that URL there. Translators use TBX to understand and disambiguate terms. Translators know and like TBX. The TBX 1.0 specification was passed October 2008. It came with a specification and an XML DTD. Um, so the, basically, we have this uh, unit that says, uh, I have this term, I have this MRK element, and I've identified concert as a term. Uh, I open the XLIF file, and I select the TBX file, which we've done here. And we notice that it has concert as uh, one of the terms. Um, and this is what the, uh, the TBX file looks like inside. Uh, it's got the term, that's the key. And then it's got a definition and it's got a, 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 um, a subject. And in some cases it has a translation, but that's not really the important thing. So what this does is it gives the translator, if they're not quite familiar with how that word concert is being used, it could be disambiguated, right? It could be a live music event, or it could be done something that you do uh, concurrently with something else, like I changed my shoes in concert with my shoelaces. I guess that's kind of a silly example. So in this case, the translator can say, oh, a live performance typically of music before an audience. Okay, that's the term that I want. So I would use this translation. Okay, so then we process the terms in the XLIF uh, file. It enters the uh, TBX matches here in the glossary namespace. And then the translator, uh, all in one fell swoop, can read this translation of the source uh, understand this term and get the information about the term. Uh, so let's look at a more uh, ambiguous example. Suppose a translator is not familiar with guitars, uh, but they're asked to translate a document about guitars. And uh, there's the, the, the um, sentence, the strings are strummed sometimes with a pick. Well, am I talking about a pick like in basketball, a pick like a verb, a pick like a pickaxe, uh, a draft pick? or a pickpocket uh, stealing money, or a dental pick. It could be any of those things. So when the uh, TBX file is uh, entered and we have pick, uh, we're told that it is um, a small, thin device of metal or plastic used to pluck a stringed instrument. Ah, plectrum. Yeah, it's a good. OK, so let's do an exercise with TBX. Hopefully, I haven't damaged that uh, um, uh, TBX files too badly. As I say, unless I make an egregious error, I just keep plotting along. Uh, so in this case, we did set our terms file, and it has some of the terms that are in this XLIF file. So for example, clash, and for example, concert. Um, we see in our XLIF file, we actually have uh, um, the uh, uh, type of match, excuse me, um, term. Uh, here we go, the uh, MRK term clash, and we have the, uh, uh, somewhere else in here, we have a, a term of concert. Uh, let's see here. Yeah, here, um, uh, term concert. But we don't have the, uh, the glossary namespace in here yet, so we're going to hit our glossary button, and it's going to say, would you like to use this glossary that you already loaded? And uh, we'll say, sure. We'll move that to source. Okay, so now if we look in here, now we have a glossary entry for concert and a glossary entry for clash. So then when the translator says, uh, I want to translate this sentence, um, I know that I'm talking about clash the band and not clash the sound or the clashing, or actually it's down here, the clashing um, uh, tie and shirt combination, for example, that I've been known to wear that my wife uh, warns me against wearing. So that's X marker, and that's um, how the translation tool works. So we got through that one. Uh, let's talk about two more. Um, since this is a web content for, or web tools for content providers class, let's specifically talk about how we translate DITA. 
and then we'll specifically talk about how we translate websites, uh, Drupal. So uh, there's a paradox. Translating uh, data can be easy uh, or it can be difficult. Uh, the paradox is that data's strength is its ability to harness many topics for a variety of outputs. Data's difficulty for the localization service provider is its many files. So the strategy is to take advantage of data's mapped file in order to manage the many topics and create an XSLT to read the map file and convert each of the referenced topics into a single XLIF file. So here's my little cartoon. Hey boss, let's switch to DITA and content management. And the boss says, ah, whatever. And we say, it's nimble. And the boss isn't very interested. It's uh, no more document-centric constraint. The boss is saying, what, document, what? It's supported by best practices. And the, uh, the boss is um, uh, interested in uh, looking at his uh, cell phone rather than continuing the conversation. It's more precise for our customers. And finally, the boss says, show me the money. And uh, we say, well, we can save boatloads of money and time in, in translation. And that finally catches the boss's attention. But nine months later, we say that it's, we're not seeing those savings. Uh, what's, the, what's wrong? Well, the paradox got us, right? Because there are um, lots and lots and lots of uh, XLIF, uh, excuse me, uh, DITA files that make up a single publication. So these can be um, uh, very tedious to, to translate one at a time. A uh, data projects consists of hundreds, thousands, or millions of topics. Localization service providers can process data topics, but it's not their core competency, and they would rightfully charge extra for the overhead and the expertise. So one way of overcoming that is to use the data XLIF round trip tool. And I'm not going to actually make you use this tool, but I will uh, show you how it works. This is a tool that I created, and it's available as an open source tool uh, at that you are, um, uh, which you can read about at uh, that URL. Uh, so the data open toolkit, uh, you're familiar with that. Uh, it transforms XML file content into deliverable formats like PDF and HTML and help systems. Nearly every data tool has a version of the data open toolkit integrated within its framework. The data open toolkit is open source and the data open toolkit can be run a command line. So um, we all know how to run, how to get and install the data open toolkit. The DITA XLIF Roundtrip plugin uh, is the software that I wrote, and it's available here at this URL. And it's a download uh, uh, that you should install uh, in the DITA Open Toolkit uh, plugins directory. So it comes with an XLIF and the DITA from XLIF uh, directory. You put them right in the plugins directory. Um, and you ha it comes with this uh, um, uh, seeded uh, XLIF projects project here. This is all about my guitars. Uh, you launch the um, data open toolkit. You change directory to the xlift directory. You type this ant command, uh, build data to xlift.xml. Uh, it creates this xlift file out of all of those data topics. Uh, you translate the xlift file. Um, in this case, I think I've translated into what I call fake, fake, fake. Uh, I just put those strings on. That's a pseudo translation. Then I uh, change directories to the data from xlif directory, and I type the command. Um, oh, and I place the uh, tra the translated xlif file there. And then I type the ant command to transform it back into data, and uh, change directory to the uh, root directory. And there I see that my translation did in fact take place. And the data open toolkit uh, did all of the processing behind the scenes. <coughs> okay. So finally, we'll talk about translating websites. Translating websites has been a unique challenge. Unlike most other content types, websites do not lend themselves to simple file exchanges with translators. You have two choices, really. You can allow the translators access to your site and have them translate on your server. This is almost never a good idea. Being non-web developers, translators can do harm to the website. Or you can export the files into an intermediary intermediary file format, have the files translated, and import them back into your website. This is a best practice. This is the key to a good workflow. Uh, the, or excuse me, the key to a, a create a good workflow is uh, to include an XLIF file as the interchange file format. <coughs> so why is letting your translators translate on your server a bad idea? Uh, the following use case shows how a website in a popular content management system, Drupal, would be translated without XLIF as prescribed in Drupal core. 
So the Drupal uh, core uh, module, the translation, um, uh, let's see here, Drupal translation core module is there. Um, and to use this, the translator logs in. Presumably, we've given our translator a login credential to our, um, our Drupal content management system. They click the translate tab. Uh, they pick uh, the language they want to translate to. Um, they open the node they want to translate, and it sure isn't very user friendly. So they translate the title, the subtitle. Okay, so far so good. Uh, I see the uh, detail page uh, title. I translate it. Uh, so far so good. I see all of this stuff. I'm not sure what that is. Um, I'm confused about that. Uh, I see this unique name uh, here, unique name. And it looks a little bit like uh, something that uh, is in English. So maybe I'll translate that into German. And I do, and boom, I just blew up every node of this content type. And I accidentally uh, added German to, my uh, to the Japanese page. So how do I know that this can happen? Well, I'd really not. I'd rather, I'd rather not really say. Uh, hint, hint, it happened uh, in our system. So I know that this is really um, can mess up a content management system. So web, why leveraging Xlib for translating CMS assets is a good uh, uh, practice. Um, the following use case shows how a website in the Drupal system should be translated leveraging the Drupal Xlift module. The Drupal Xlift module is available there. Uh, Truth in Advertising, uh, uh, Gabor Hachi from uh, Drupal, uh, from Acquia, and I uh, wrote this uh, software way back in the day. Um, the fundamental dev difference uh, is that the Xlift tool module brings, excuse me, the fundamental difference the Xlift tool module brings is all Drupal steps are done by Drupal administrator the translator does all of his or her work in a computer-aided translation tool. So the idea is that the uh, Drupal administrator logs in, um, picks the XLIF module, uh, selects the node type to translate. In this case, we're going to translate the bit error rate testers. Uh, we export those nodes to XLIF, and Drupal does all of that behind the scenes. It just grabs all of the nodes that we've identified, save it to uh, your desktop locally, uh, we needed to do a little bit of processing, uh, post-processing. For example, we don't want this uh, field um, inventory status to be translated. So we mark that as do not translate. Uh, the uh, localization service provider leverages the translation memory and translates. Um, and then we have the, uh, the, the s segment that we do want translated, translated. And we have the segment that we don't want translated, uh, not translated, because the state equals final prevents the translator from translating that. And then at the end of the day, we have our translated site. So there you have it. This is the lesson for class six of the web content for or web tools for content providers class. Uh, hopefully you liked it. Uh, if you have any trouble with any of this, uh, by the way, since uh, I must have gone through a bad step with the TMX file, I will demonstrate that in class just to show that it really does work uh, and that because I was probably hurrying along, uh, something went wrong. So hopefully that was useful to you. As always, if you have any questions, please let me know. Otherwise, signing out.